Test. Scoot it down a little bit there. Good morning to everyone. Good to see everyone out this morning. And uh, as you can tell, Ken Hope is not here. Either that or he's gained a lot of weight and turned gray. Uh, I understand he's going to be in a meeting up near Paris at a little place called Honey Grove or something like that. And uh, so he asked me to come fill in for him today. And I'm going to do that as soon as we get adjusted here. The rain kind of slowed us down this morning. And uh, we have some good friends visiting here who experienced the death in their family. And uh, I know you want to remember them in your prayers, but normally I would see them over in Mount Pleasant, Texas, at the congregation where I used to preach there. And uh, all, either that or in Nashville, Tennessee, where they live. And I looked up and I thought, you're in the wrong place today, brother, but they've come to be with their family and I guess look the congregation up here has been one close by and lo and behold, like a bad penny, I keep turning up in their lives. I know you want to meet them afterwards. Let's pause for a word of prayer as we begin this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and we thank you for every blessing of life. We thank you, Father, for the rain. We desperately needed it. We're so grateful to you for sending it our way and watering the trees and flowers and grass, replenishing the lakes and the streams and the aquifers that provide the, the water that we so desperately need to live. We thank you for the oxygen that we breathe. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for every blessing. We especially thank you, Father, for the spiritual sun that shines in our life your son Jesus, thankful for the encouragement that his life and his example gives us, thankful for the sacrifice of his life and his blood, that paid that debt we could not pay, ransomed us back from sin and from self and from Satan as the perfect savior, the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice to pay for our sin. And we know, Father, that Ultimately, it was our sins that nailed him to that tree. And we're sorry, Father, for our sin. We ask your forgiveness through your grace and through the blood of Jesus. We pray for those who are sick that are not able to be here, for those that are bereaved and the loss and suffering that they have at their life at this time. We pray for Brother Ken and Julie as they are away this week in a meeting. We pray that you bless Ken. Thankful for him and all he means to this congregation. Thankful for the elders of this church and for this church that stands as a lighthouse in a world lost in sin. We pray for our government, Father. Pray that you will guide and direct our leaders through the Holy Word to keep us founded on the principles that this nation was founded on, the religious freedom that we take for granted, Father. We realize it could easily be taken away from us and we could be like people in other places that have to meet in secret because of the threat of government. We're thankful, Father, for our freedom. We pray that you would help us to work as Christians to keep that freedom alive and let people see Jesus in our lives. Be with us now as we study about Job and the suffering that he experienced. Help us to understand, Father, why we suffer and the the benefits and values that can come from suffering. And Father, selfishly we pray that you would keep that suffering from us as much as possible, but we know sometimes that strength can be gained from suffering. Thank you, Father, for every blessing again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, Brother Ken said y'all are beginning a series of lessons on the book of Job. And uh, I guess... Uh, there's no greater thesis passage for the book of Job than chapter 3, verses 23 through 26, where Job says, Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is coming to me. 
I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. And trouble does come into the lives of all of us, doesn't it? Is there anybody here who has experienced suffering? Let me see some hands. I'm going to say, y'all are the most unsuffering people I've ever seen. <laughs> Ah, afraid to raise your hand, maybe. We've all suffered, haven't we? We've all experienced problems. We've lost loved ones, had sickness and illness. Uh, as we get older, and most of the people in this auditorium are of that range, middle age or above, uh, we begin to have aches and pains that we didn't have when we were younger. We can't do all the things we did when we were uh, young lads and young uh, ladettes. And uh, we... Uh, we have those aches and pains and problems, and we have uh, difficulties with our jobs and difficulties with our families and difficulties sometimes with our neighbors, and suffering comes in our life, as Job said. And here was Job who, as he acknowledges, was hedged about by God. Remember the day that, that Satan came to God, and God talks to him and says, Have you considered my servant Job? And he says, well, yeah, he's faithful, he serves you, but you've hedged him all about. I have a friend, Brother Ken Upchurch, maybe he's been here and presented information to you about the work in Tanzania that he has had a big part in over the last uh, 15 years as they've helped to begin some preaching schools there and do a great work. That work, by the way, in its oversight is being transferred from the Kensington Woods Congregation in Hattiesburg, Mississippi to the Bear Valley School of Preaching uh, congregation there in, in uh, uh, Denver. But it's been a great work. And Brother Ken has an expression that he sometimes uses in his prayer that I've noticed that I really like, where he asks God to hedge us about and prop us up on every leaning side. <laughs> and I like that. I've spent a lot of time out in the country uh, noticing old buildings and barns, you know, and sometimes they begin to lean a little bit, and the owner maybe to keep it useful, maybe it's an old house or an old barn that it's not useful for anything but maybe storing hay and they put some two by fours out there on the leaning side and prop it up and keep it standing a little longer. And I like that idea of the Lord propping us up on every leaning side. Who in the Old Testament needed to be propped up in order for the Israelites to win the battle? I'm deaf. Moses, okay, remember that uh, when they were fighting he would hold his hands up and they would win the battle but when his hands begin to be let down then uh, they would lose the battle so we need to be propped up on every leaning side but I wonder would you like God to ask about you have you noticed my servant and insert your name here in the blank you know would you like that would you like him to focus on you how would you like to have Satan really zero in on your life and think about your life and whether or not he can make you suffer. Maybe some of you say, well, I feel like I've been there and done that and got the t-shirt, uh, that I have suffered plenty. The point is when Satan turns his gaze in our direction, and he does that occasionally to all of us, doesn't he? The point really of my lesson today, and I, Ken kind of gave me carte blanche to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about as long as it had something to do with Job and, and suffering and problems and things like that. The point of this lesson is that we can have the confidence to, uh, to deal with suffering and to overcome it, uh, even though the devil wants us to fall. And he brings suffering into our life, of course, to cause us to get discouraged and to get disappointed and, and disheartened, get depressed and, and want to sit down over in the corner somewhere and throw in the towel and quit. And uh, he thinks maybe, you know, I can do that to you and get you to quit. But God, of course, promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation hath overtaken us but such as is common to man. And he says, God is faithful. And he will not, and the King James uses an interesting word there. He says, he will not suffer you to be tempted. Now, there's two meanings to the word suffer. There is the word that we're thinking about today, and that's the idea of, of facing problems, of of feeling hurt and heartache and pain in our lives, either physically or emotionally or spiritually. 
But the old King James English also used the word suffer to talk about permit. Remember when Jesus said, suffer the little children and forbid them not that they come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he wasn't saying make the children feel pain. He was saying permit the children to come to me. We don't use that word much anymore. I doubt that your child comes to you and said, would you suffer me to go to uh, the, the skating rink and go skating with my friends or go to the bowling alley and go bowling? You know, they just don't use that. They say, can I have your permission? But the, the old word meant to have permission. So think about this, 1 Corinthians 10 13, there hath no temptation overtaken you, but such as is common to man, God who is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted. He'll not permit you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with, excuse me, each temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it or to endure it, some translations say. Trouble came or trouble will come, and thus the question is, how are we going to deal with it? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I've entitled this lesson, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Or an alternate title could be, How Do We Deal With? How Do We Cope With the Problems, the Suffering in Our Life? And I don't know what all you're going to learn in talking about the book of Job, but hopefully this theme will keep coming back up because we see Job who had everything going his way. He was wealthy. He was uh, blessed, he had children, he had crops, he had friends, uh, he was well respected. And all of a sudden, in just the twinkling of an eye, in one day, it all is taken away from him. And he has uh, his children killed and his cattle and possessions stolen. And he loses his physical health. And he could have lost his wife. I always felt, felt it was interesting, you know, that God said, you can touch him, but don't touch his own personal life. But he leaves his wife there in this particular occasion. And ladies, I'm not picking on you, but in this particular occasion, the devil was using his wife. Remember, his wife came along and said, why don't you just curse God and die, you know? And uh, so the devil knew he could use her as an ally in trying to cause Job to lose his faith. Uh, and so he, he left her alone. But he basically lost everything that was uh, of value and importance to him. But he would not curse God. He would not uh, challenge God. And uh, it's a very interesting study to read about his three friends, uh, one of whom is one of the shortest guys, perhaps the shortest guy in the Bible. You thought the shortest guy in the Bible was Zacchaeus. Maybe some of you said no, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, get it, uh, was shorter. But there's a fellow here who's one of Job's three friends named Bildad the Shuhite. Okay, so I think he's probably the shortest guy. He was only as tall as a shoe. But anyway, Eliphaz and Bildad, the shoe height, and Zophar, Job's three friends, came to him and, and uh, challenged him. It was interesting, when they first came to him, they, they just sat with him for a week as he sat in the ashes and, and around the fire. And I think they had the right idea at first, and somehow you know, they were overcome with trying to give him some advice and help him out and encourage him. And then that's when they began to mess up, you know, as they challenged him and said, you're suffering because you've done wrong, and that wasn't true at all. Uh, maybe that's the best thing we can do sometimes with people who suffer, is just go and, and sit with them. You ever gone to a uh, funeral for friends or gone to the visitation and felt like you didn't know what to say? Anybody want to comment on that? This is Bible class. It's okay to comment. We're not in, in worship right now, so even you ladies can speak if you'd like to and make a comment about that. You ever not known what to say to someone who has suffered? You ever had anybody, anybody ever had a friend that's been depressed? Family member that's been depressed? You know the worst thing to tell them? Hello? Anybody home out there? <laughs> What's the worst thing to tell a person that's depressed? The what? You snap out of it. Okay, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't be depressed. That's only going to make them depressed more. They know they shouldn't be depressed, you know, especially if they're a Christian. But you know, depression is a, a serious problem. And what they need is someone just to let them know you care that you're there to encourage them. And a lot of times I think maybe we do more harm than good when 
we try to say the right thing. You know, the right thing may be just to be quiet. If someone said God gave us two eyes and two ears and only one mouth and he intended us to learn something from that, you know, we want to spend more time looking and listening than we do talking. Now, I say that as a preacher, you know, I make my living talking, so, uh, you know, I talk all the time. On Sunday nights when I get home from services, uh, Janice wants to talk because she hadn't had me talk to her all day and all I want to do is be left alone. You know, I've talked all day and I just want to be quiet, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm a big talker. You know, my mother used to say I was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. So, uh, you know, they, I guess, you know, if I'd been skilled with some skill, they said, well, let's make a surgeon or a doctor, lawyer out of him, something like that, you know. But I was blef- blessed with the gift of gabs. <laughs> they said, let's make a preacher out of him, you know. But uh, we, we talk all the time. But we recognize, of course, from our study of the Word of God that sometimes Maybe the best thing to do is to not talk, not say anything. And when they first did that, then they were probably really helping him out because he knew he had friends. Yes, sir. Okay. You know, we have uh, plenty of people who were quote-unquote Christians. I'll include some of the Old Testament, you know, with that idea of in prospect they were a part of spiritual Israel, which is what being a Christian, being a part of the church is all about. Who cried? Who was the weeping prophet? Jeremiah, that's right. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He went around weeping all the time because he was so depressed and discouraged about the spiritual condition in Israel. And uh, what, which one of the genders are always taught not to cry? Men, you know. It's not manly to cry, you know. Of course now, you know, society's a little bit different now. You know, they're helping the little boys to get in touch with their feminine side and all that kind of stuff. Don't do that too much, you know, or we may have another problem on the, the hands. And so you do, you do need to teach them uh, to be manly. But, you know, sometimes it's the manly thing to do to cry. What did Jesus do when he uh, went to the family of his friend Lazarus? He wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, John 11, 35. Jesus wept. And you know, people have speculated about why he wept there. You know, was he weeping because he was about to bring Lazarus back from the dead and make him come back to this old earth? Well, the Bible tells us there. A lot of people just haven't read the Bible carefully. The Bible tells us why he wept. The crowd saw him weeping, and they understood why he was weeping. Behold how he loved him. He loved those people. What does the word tell us to do when people we love, people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ, when they're weeping, what are we supposed to do? Supposed to weep, that classic text in chapter 12 of Romans, you know, rejoice with those that rejoice. We need to be happy with those who are happy and not be jealous, not be envious but be happy for them if good fortune happens to some brother or sister in christ here you ought to rejoice with them you know if they get a raise at work and are able to buy a new car instead of saying boy i wish i could get a raise i wish i could have a new car you ought to pat them on the back and say man you deserve that you've worked so hard i know you put time in out there i've never seen anybody deserve that i'm happy for you can i ride in it can i take a ride with you rejoice with them but when they're down as our good sister over here said you need to weep with them. You need to cry with them. Yes, sir. Control weeping. Well, you know, if it's if it's genuine from the heart, uh, sometimes it's hard to control. You know, I've seen preachers, and I've sometimes myself uh, nearly broken down uh, from from uh, the experience of, of uh, thinking about things, you know, and you're talking about things and preaching about things. When I preach about something wrong here, brother, you're not hearing me good enough? Oh, we can't hear them. Oh, we can't hear them. Okay, good, good, okay. All right, we're going to be the, 
We've got to have the roving mic here. If you want to speak up, he'll bring you the microphone. There we go. I thought, man, I'm hearing an echo in here. I thought I was hearing myself so good. But. What, I, what I mean by control weeping, I, I don't mean just, uh, I think when Jesus uh, wept, he controlled himself. He didn't, he didn't go running all over the place. And, you know what I mean? And, uh, and uh, uh, where he might hurt himself or, or fall down. You know what I'm saying? Well, certainly we always ought to stay in control because everything needs to be done decently and in order, the scriptures say. But, you know, sometimes when we're, when we're really moved emotionally, I, I love to preach about Jesus, and specifically I love to preach about the crucifixion because to me that story is the motivating story that brings us to the Lord. If you can't be motivated by the, the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ, then you can't be motivated. You've got a heart of stone. And I've been preaching before about Christ and, and just really had trouble, you know, controlling uh, my emotions in doing so because I get to thinking about it and feeling it. How many of you went to see the movie the, uh, that uh, Mel Gibson made about uh, the, the life of Christ? Did anybody see that? You know, I spent my life studying the crucifixion, studying it scripturally, studying it biblically, studying it medically from what Jesus experienced there, thinking about it. And I thought I understood how bad a scourging could be. You know, I've read uh, medical descriptions of it and historical and, and uh, descriptions of it. The Romans had perfected this to a fine art of being the worst way that you could ever cause anyone suffering and would be a scourging and then to crucify them. And uh, I thought I understood how bad it was. You know, I've read about the cat of nine tails that they would use and tie bits of bone and glass and stone in there and how the, the, the uh, thongs would come around and, and grab into your, your belly and sometimes rip people's bellies open to where they were disemboweled and would come around their head and knock out eyes and teeth and things like that. And I've just thought about it, you know. What would it be like? And I went to that movie and I remember... I get emotional just thinking about it right now. I remember sitting in that movie and watching them in Hollywood's way of being able to show sometimes what, what things are like and what they would be like when people are hurt. And I remember watching that scourging, you know, and thinking at any moment they'd stop, you know. And the Jews had a law, you know, 39 lashes. So they would stop, or, you know, 40 lashes really was the law. They would stop at 39 unless they be guilty of violating the law and going over the number of lashes that were allowed for the punishment. The Romans didn't have a law. The time to stop the scourging under Roman law was when the person was unconscious and couldn't feel the pain anymore. And so they kept on beating him and beating him and beating him and beating him. And you remember on the movie, the thong that held him to the post came loose and, and he was just down on the ground groveling and, and they kept on. And I remember sitting there in the theater the tears running down my, my cheeks. My lap was getting wet. I was crying so profusely. And I remember saying under my breath, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because I feel like it was my sins that put him there, put him in that predicament. He died for my sins, the Bible says. And I can't even talk about it now without getting emotional. My son, uh, two of my three children are here today. And both of those two who are here are married and their spouses are here. And my oldest son, Jonathan, just got back from Afghanistan. He spent almost a year away from his family and a little over nine months in Afghanistan on a protection detail for a general. He's in the Texas National Guard, and I thought they were supposed to protect us when we had a tornado, but they send him over to fight in the wars nowadays, and they send him over to Afghanistan. And I remember praying every day that God would protect him and praying that God would bring him back not only physically whole, but mentally and emotionally and spiritually whole because of what he perhaps had to see or had to do over there. And he got back, and they welcomed him home back at the congregation where we worked and where we've attended for many years. And they asked me to preach there a couple of Sundays ago on Sunday night because I've taken the new... Uh, regular, I guess we'll call it full-time, part-time work with the Old Grove congregation there out in the county. And the only reason I'm here today is I'd promised Ken to come and fill in for him back before I took that job. But they asked me to preach there at North Jefferson in Mount Pleasant where I preached for five and a half years. And uh, I preached 
some things from the heart. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to do was to tell them how much I appreciated them praying for him by name. Uh, every service, every prayer, nearly. May not have been a prayer said there where he was not mentioned by name for over a year. And you know, when your neighbor's kid gets sent off to war, it's a conflict. When your kid gets sent off to war, it's a, it's a world war, you know. It's kind of like when your neighbor's out of work, it's a recession. When you're out of work, it's a depression, you know. I can sit behind the desk and prof profess all kinds of wisdom to people that are concerned about their children, you know. But when it comes to my children, I become a basket case. <laughs> and I kind of lost it in the course of that lesson in uh, thanking them for praying for my son. Because I felt like the, the prodigal son's father in some ways. You know, my son that was dead is alive again. It was lost. Now it's found. He's home. He's home. And I was so thankful for it. So uh, we can get emotional and we can sometimes lose it, I guess we might say. And uh, I kind of wonder about people that aren't able to lose it myself, you know, if they have hearts of stone. Well, let's get back to our discussion and talk about some things that that uh, would help us to overcome our suffering, maybe help us to regain our composure and not lose it and not stay depressed and down in the dumps because there are things that happen in all of our lives that can cause us discouragement. The last few years, I guess, uh, my wife and I have suffered a lot with our children because our other child who's not here, who's away in Bible camp, uh, got a serious debilitating disease called Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and Pretty much missed the better part of his youth because when he was about 16, he got this and and uh, he had to have major surgery here uh, a year or so ago and have his colon removed. And he's had a lot of difficulties with with health problems and and we've seen him be near the point of death a couple of times and we've experienced that and I experienced uh, going without a job for about a year and and various and sundry things and so. Experienced my kid going over to, to war and being concerned about him. And, you know, I said it as a preacher and preached for years, you know, about being anxious in nothing but in everything. But again, you know, when it comes to my kids, all, all of a sudden, you know, that's, uh, that's stuff for other people. You know, I'm, I'm anxiety uh, prone when it comes to thinking about my children. But maybe by talking about these things this morning and the time that we have, maybe we can come to some understanding of how to deal with those things. And. Hopefully God has taught me some things in the last couple of years of dealing with these things that have made me uh, more sympathetic and more empathetic, more patient. I guarantee you that if you were to come to me and tell me my, my child is sick and I'm worried, I would, I'd want to listen. I'd want to hear. I'd want to try to help you and reach out to you. And if you said my kid got shipped to Timbuktu or Kalamazoo, you know, with the military, I would be sympathetic to you. And if you needed to cry on my shoulder and I needed to change shirts and let you cry some more, I'd do that, you know. Here's the first thing. We need to remember that troubles are the common lot of man. Maybe that'll help us, you know, to realize that we're not in this boat alone. I'm not unique. Man has a way sometimes of believing that his or her problems are different, more pressing, harder to deal with and faced by others. And we might call this the woe is me syndrome. But you know, there's an old truism, misery loves company. If that's true, and I think it is in some ways, at least as it applies to this lesson, and we understand that we're not unique, that troubles are the common lot of all mankind, and maybe we can find a little comfort in that. Sometimes it seems that certain troubles are more prevalent than at other times. Uh, I think we're living in a time here in America where social problems are on the increase, crime and divorce, the breakdown of the home, child neglect, abuse, problems in the Lord's church maybe are on the rise because too many places are not giving the gospel its due and uh, they've given up on the gospel. They don't think it's the power of God into salvation anymore and tribulation comes sometimes because of the word. Matthew 13, 21, in speaking of the stony ground heart says, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended. But the Bible still says, of course, buy the truth and sell it not, Proverbs 23, 23. So understand when you have problems, when you are faced with things that are causing you to be discouraged and depressed, 
that you're not alone. There's probably someone around you that has maybe gone through that. You know, when our, our kids were coming up, if we had difficulty in dealing with some issue or problem with them, you know what I did? I went and found someone who understood that. Some parent, you know, that had a multiplicity of children, and I said, you know, have you experienced this problem with your, your children? And to find someone that said, yeah, you know, uh, Sam or Betty or whatever, you know, they picked the name out, said they went through this phase and they start talking about it, and I was all ears, you know, I wanted to listen and see uh, what I might do to, to help with that. Secondly, I think we can use our problems for, for spiritual growth and for character building. Paul said in Romans 5, 3 through 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience worketh experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now, that passage is a hard passage to get our minds around because it says we grow through tribulation. But none of us like tribulation, do we? Has any of you prayed lately, Lord, send me some suffering, some more suffering, because I need some more patience, you know. Be careful what you pray for, you know, because the Bible says tribulation worketh patience. Be careful what you sing about. There's a song that I love, absolutely love. It's one of the, the kids' songs, Break My Heart. Learned it at Bible camp several years ago. And we were on our way to Alabama to Bible camp several years ago when I was preaching at Maybank back in 2001. We always stopped at Vicksburg, Mississippi and had a picnic lunch there in the, the Civil War uh, battlefields. And there's a place there called the Illinois Monument, it's a big rotunda building. And you can go inside there and two people can sing together and sound like the the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or something, you know, it reverberates in there. And we found that out several years ago, so we'd take the kids in there and, and sing. It was always interesting because you had to walk up a little hill to get there and, uh, or some, a long set of steps, and people would come in, you know, expecting to see 500 people singing and, you know, be a handful of kids singing. And so we went up there and we sang for a little bit and listened to the, the beauty of it, and we stopped with the song, Break My Heart. We walked down the hill and got in the vans and the trucks and the cars to head on the trip. And I thought, I'm having a heart attack because <laughs> my chest was hurting. It felt like a gorilla was standing on me. And I told Janice, and of course she became concerned. And I said, don't tell anybody else because we had a paramedic with us. And I said, I don't want to go to the hospital here in the little one-horse town of Vicksburg. I said, I want to go to Jackson where there's a real hospital. It's only about 45 minutes away. And she says, you may not make it that 45 minutes. And I said, I'll take my chances, you know. And so we went to Jackson, and, and I got on the, the radio, and I told the guy that was paramedic, I said, would you mind up here where you see the blue hospital sign and stopping and pulling in? He said, why do we need to do that? And I said, because I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> he liked to have one himself, you know, worrying about the preacher. But anyway, uh, I ended up spending the weekend at Jackson, Mississippi, and the rest of them went on to camp. I got a couple of stents put in. And I hadn't been back to see a doctor since then because if you want to stay well, stay away from the doctors. But anyway, uh, the point is, um, what is the point? Be careful what you pray about. Be careful what you sing about. It might happen. We need to remember to let our problems increase our resolve and our character. You know, problems are not pleasant. Anybody like church problems? You ever had any church problems here at North, North uh, Garland? <laughs> at Central, Centerville Road in Garland? Started to say Broadway. You know, it used to be Broadway. You ever had any problems? Are y'all the perfect church? You never have any problems? You know, Ephesians six ten says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hebrews twelve eleven says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Some some churches enjoy peace more than others because they've experienced the problems of not having peace and that peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby pray for strength because God doesn't want us to be defeated by our problems he wants us to win he wants us to get on with the program and sometimes he sends those little problems and obstacles because we grow stronger by it we need to have that optimistic spirit that that uh the man who invented the electric light bulb have, 
had, you remember a fellow by the name of Thomas Edison? You know, I think he tried over 1,000 different substances to be the filament of his little light bulb. And somewhere along about seven or 800, he was keeping track. Someone said, you know, why don't you just quit? You know, you've tried seven or 800 things that haven't worked. And he says, those have all been successes because now I know seven or 800 things that won't make a filament, you know. <laughs> if I keep trying, I'll eventually find the filament. And we're blessed, of course, because of that today. Otherwise, we'd be sitting here in the dark or have coal or lamps burning around the place and no Eutychus might fall out of the window from all the smoke when he got tired and sleepy. The third thing, we can get through it. You can get through your problems. We're not unique. Our problems help us grow spiritually. And thirdly, we can get through it. What does Philippians 4.13 say? Every one of you probably can quote that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everybody say that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Did he say some things? Did he say most things? Many things? All things, didn't he? And we need to trust the promises of the Scripture. We need to obey the imperatives of the Scripture, but we need to trust the promises of the Scripture. Look in your Bibles at Ephesians 3. Turn over in your Bible if you have your Bible with you. Let's start in verse 7. Whereof I am made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Now this is super Christian. This is the Apostle Paul, you know. There's none of us that haven't put him up on a pedestal and thought, man, live. How did he do it? You know, how was he the man he was? But here he is, he says, I'm the least of all the saints. This grace is given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Christ. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith, by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faith, ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of the glory, of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, Paul likes superlatives. Look at the next verse. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I've heard Johnny Ramsey quote that passage, I guess, a hundred times in lessons and sermons. To him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. You know... <laughs> I think we sometimes shortchange God. We short sheet God. Any of you ever go to Boy Scout camp or Army camp or, or boot camp or somewhere? Short sheet your, your bunk mate there. Have a little fun with them. We sometimes short sheet God. We short change God. We think, you know, well, you know, I know He created the world and I know He's the giver and sustainer of life, the giver of all good gifts, but. You know, he's busy. He's too busy to worry about me. No, he's not. I got three kids, and I'm a busy man. I work all week at a, a job selling cars for my oldest son who owns a car lot. Now, don't come up and ask me out in the foyer, how did a preacher get to be a used car salesman? And Because that's a misnomer, okay? I'll tell you, everything's wrong with it. You know, you call me up and see one on the Internet and say, what about that car? I say, that's a piece of junk. You don't want that. I've had people driving by that piece of junk because I was honest and told them it was a piece of junk. We sell a lot of cars because we tell them exactly what's wrong with it. 
I told John, I said, you know, if you'll practice honesty and integrity, God will make you successful, and he has. So successful, he gave me a job. <laughs> but I preach on, uh, on the weekends, every Sunday, teach Bible classes, visit, and I work. I'm a busy man, and I've got some other interests and things. I hardly ever sleep. But if one of my three kids calls me, I'm never too busy to be concerned about what they're concerned about. I drop everything and go running for my three kids. And I've got two grandkids. And my three kids can sit and wait while I wait on my two grandkids. You know, whatever they want, Grandpa's going to do his best to get it for them. I took them yesterday to Legoland and to the aquarium. And we got down to the bottom and my son-in-law and my son who were there with me, the girls went out and did girl things and us guys took the little, little shavers to the aquarium and we got down to the bottom and I said, let's get them something to remember this by. And they, being the fine son and fine son-in-law that they are, they said, oh no, you don't need to spend your money on that. And I said, yeah, granddad does. Granddad can afford a little trinket for them. And so we got a pirate hat and a hook for the oldest one. Arr, we heard that all afternoon, you know. And we got a little shark, 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 you know, for the, the little baby. And uh, granddad was never happier, you know. Granddad would have bought him the big size if daddy and son-in-law had, you know, been a little more agreeable. They were saying, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, you know. But granddads are made for spoiling their grandkids, aren't they? And the Bible says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask of him? Isn't that what Jesus said somewhere over there in the book of Matthew? Why do we want to give good gifts to our children? Why do you want to give good gifts to your children and your grandchildren? There's a simple answer to it, because you're made in the image of who? God. God put that in all of us because he put himself in all of us. It is a part of the natural love that is built into our bodies for us to take care of our children and grandchildren. And when we don't do that, then we have sinned against the very nature that is built within us as human beings and we get that from God and if we want to give good gifts to our children Jesus used this as an example he said if you want to give good gifts to your children then it's kind of like duh here's your sign <laughs> you know God wants to give good gifts to you what did James say about it you have not because you what you ask not Jesus said ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find Knock and the door shall be open to you. Yes, sir. Hang on just a minute. We got the microphone coming. We want everybody to hear you. Okay. Uh, didn't he say you ask and have not because you ask amiss, wishing to consume these things on your lust? Yes, sir. You know your Bible. That's the next part of that verse in James, but that wasn't a part of what I was talking about. So <laughs> I, I did what Brother George Dehoff taught me years ago. Many of you, how many of you know George Dehoff? Ever read any of his books? Okay, he used to sit in the audience where I preached at, at uh, East Main in Murfreesboro. And I thought, brother, how am I going to put up with this? The great George Dehoff, who's written more books and preached more sermons and baptized more people than anybody I know, you know, is going to be out there in the audience. And I preached my first Sunday there after they offered me the job. And Brother Dehoff had had a stroke and he came up to me. And I thought, what's he going to say? And he said, Oh, they got no good preaching when I hear it. And that was good preaching. <laughs> he encouraged me. But he also taught me something. If you look at his books and his commentaries, when there's something that's very difficult, he did the Passover. He just passed over it and went on to something else. And so I passed over that. That's right. Sometimes we ask and receive not because we ask amiss, that we might consume it on our lust. But God wants to give us good things. That's the point. Because you want to give your children good things, and he's perfect. So ask him for that. Understand you can get through it. Now, is that a warning bell or is that it? Are we done? That's the first bell. How about that? We got one more point. I can get that in. How much time do we have to get that point in? Five minutes. Five minutes. Four and a half now because I asked the question. The last point, we face our problems as members of the family of God. Now, if you forget everything else I've said here this morning, 
remember this point because really this is the this is what we need more than all the rest because those other ones if you've ever read the Bible even casually you know those other things but here's the thing we sometimes forget that we are members of the family of God we face our problems as members of the family of God Paul said in 1 Timothy 5 8 if any provide not for his own especially for those of his own house he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel if you are a bum you need to quit being a bum go out and get you a job and support your family and take care of your family I've known a few bums in my day back when years ago I preached in Arkansas we passed out a little thing about people to tell about themselves because we were printing a new directory and we were trying to put as much information as we could in it and this I put it on their occupation you know I figured it'd be interesting to know where people work and what they did and this one guy wrote bum on there and he was he was what we called an Arkansas go-getter he went and got his wife a job and then when she got through work he went and, and got her you know he'd go get her at work you know that's what we called an Arkansas getter and he told the truth at least but he was a bum in that same congregation there was another guy that wouldn't hold a job and it's not that he didn't couldn't do anything he was a very skilled person but he was a bum and his wife ended up divorcing him now that's not a scriptural reason for divorce but you know what I didn't feel too sorry for him in a lot of ways I tried to counsel with him tried to get him to stay together and she said look I am tired of this you know I'm tired of having to support this family and I said well that's not a reason for getting a divorce but if I'd had my way I'd have taken him out, out behind the building and slapped him up one side and down the other real good I thought that's what he needed is to go out to the woodshed me take off my belt and whip him you know I thought about it a couple of times and I certainly could have done it I was plenty big enough to do it and younger then I'm old gray now you know and probably fall down trying but I thought that's what he needed was a good whipping you know we're to take care of our family now here's the point we are the family of God you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ and the Bible says as we have opportunity let us do good to all men especially to those who are the household of the faith and the next verse gives us a key or back excuse me back up ye who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness looking to yourself lest you also be tempted when a brother is overtaken in a fault when he falls when he gets caught in Satan's trap and the next verse is critical to all this to verse 1 and also verse 10 because it says what Galatians 6 verse 2 you know it bear what bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ Paul told Timothy in 1st Timothy 3 15 if you tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God which is the church of God the living God the pillar and ground of the truth you know I am God's child you are God's child therefore God is going to care for you and me you can put money in the bank on that and that's why it's so sad when people give up on the church because if you don't love the church you can't love God because we're all the family of God where could I go but to the Lord remember when Peter Lord asked him you gonna to leave too and Peter said where are we gonna go you only have the words of eternal life where are we going to go face your problems as a member of the family of God be there for each other help each other out we are too standoffish in our own day and time you know we come to church and we say how you doing brother good to see you again Pat them on the back, boom, off we go to the restaurant. And we could care less about them until we see them again next Sunday. How you doing, brother? Shake hands with them, pat them on the back, and off we go to our job or whatever. Why did the first century grow? Don't tell me this. I heard the second bell. Why did the first century church grow? It grew because they loved each other. They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and gave them to those who had need. If you want to see the church grow again in our generation, you try that. You become real brothers and sisters in Christ. And Katie, bar the door. You can face your problems as members of the family of God. I don't know what I'd have done sometimes when my son was sick, when my son was in, other son was in Afghanistan, if it hadn't been for the brethren who loved me and prayed for me and helped me. I hope this lesson has been helpful to you.